Welcome back, and we are now at part two of this week's New Comics Pajas. So, uh, I apologize if there was some noise, some background noise that might have been distracting. Uh, again, I seem to be still having some problems with my computer's fan, uh, which of course is like right back here by the webcam, by the, you know, the built-in webcam, which is of course by the mic, and then of course my air conditioning kicked in because I am in... Uh, the Valley of the Sun in Arizona, and it was 101 degrees today, and it's like 79 degrees right now, and it's uh, it's 1:12 a.m. So still a little warm. Anyway, so continuing going forward, uh, still working on DC. Uh, we have Frankenstein, Agent of Shade, number nine. Uh, I love this title. I'm going to be really sad when Jeff Lemire leaves it. Uh, because apparently this is his, if my understanding is correct, that he's going to be leaving this title after number 10. I, I don't know who's going to be stepping in for him. It's something I have to look up. Um, if you know, please comment. So, uh, because I'm lazy, I just, I, I, sometimes I just like, sometimes I just like to be surprised. Uh, and sometimes I really, really care. In this, in this particular case, I should care, but I feel like whoever might come in afterwards might be a good fit for this, unless it's like, you know, like, you know, some of the other hacks, like Scott, Scott Lobdell or JT, or JT Crawl or, you know, whatever, some of the other people that are working at the, the new 52 right now. So I'm hoping it's not. Anyway, moving forward. So basically, we have Frankenstein and we have Nina. Now, of course, this is the aftermath of the last issue, where you know the, uh, the you know the, the spawn of Frankenstein issue, where basically both uh, Frank and Lady Frank have to basically kill their own son, and basically, you know, Frank is really of. He's of two minds right now. Basically, he want he's thinking about staying. But he's also really seriously thinking about leaving Shade, because it's just th that to him was almost unforgivable as far as what Father Time did to his son. So, uh, but basically, what we have here is we have a tie-in with what's actually going on in Animal Man right now, which is and Swamp Thing. If you want to go there too, because it's basically it's. The Rot. It's Frankenstein and Nina investigating the Rot. Because they come across the body of the police officer, the detective that was kind of helping out the uh, the Baker family, and who was ultimately possessed by the Rot. And we just, we have these, these really... Uh, the, the issue, more than anything, while having some really cool action moments, it's also a great character study of these two characters, of Frankenstein and Nina. Because while Frankenstein considers himself to be less than a man, Nina surprisingly kind of sees him as something more than a man. And, you know, ultimately it's, you know, as the, the melee, the, you know, the fire, the black bomb and everything like that, these are all things that, that are great for the action of the issue, but it, but underneath it all, having this emotional core of this, this kind of very tender, uh, perhaps romance between Frankenstein and Nina is really at the heart of this issue. And it's great. I love that stuff. This is the stuff that keeps me coming back for more. I love great character moments. I love great character issues. And like I said, while there's still a lot of action, there's still these lovely character moments that Lemire puts into this uh, this issue. And of course, Alberto Ponticelli's art still keeps going. You know, it, it's still weird and cool, and it's just awesome. I love this issue. A very, very, very solid four and a half out of five edging more towards five. This was just a terrific week for DC all around. So moving into the independence, let's start with Invincible number 91. So basically we have uh, Zandal, uh, aka the, the new Invincible, and we have Eve and Oliver and Alan. Basically they're looking, they kind of team up 
against Dinosaurus, who basically has been, via Thrag, they've been led to believe by Thrag that Dinosaurus is actually holding Mark hostage. But in reality, of course, Dinosaurus is was protecting Mark because Thrag wants him dead. The reason, we don't know yet. But it has something to do with, ultimately, with ruling uh, the Viltrumites. So that's where we have this, uh, you know, this kind of this this mystery that's still brewing, and we still, of course, have the the effect of this uh, the scourge virus is uh, still taking its toll on Mark, as we see in the last page. Um, this is becoming an increasingly disjointed affair for me. I'm I'm not really caring about any of these characters as much as I used to. Because it, it's weird, because when I first started reading this comic, I fell head over fucking heels in love with it. And, you know, th events like the Viltrumite War and so on and so forth, these things really kept me going. There was a lot of emotional impact to just about every issue. And, you know, of course, you know, Mark kind of growing up and learning to use his powers. It's lost a lot of that element. It just seems to be... It, it's, it, it is still still telling kind of organic story, but a lot of it just, do, it, it's not that fun to read anymore. And that's a real problem for this title because this was supposed to be Image's Spider-Man. You know, when Spider-Man becomes not fun to read like it did during like J. Michael Straczynski's run, uh, then you're fucked. You know, of course, and that's why I think they ultimately did away with that. But... You know, here, you know, because Robert Kirkman, obviously an extraordinarily talented writer. And, you know, Ryan Otley, great artist. And the art's great in this issue. But, like I said, I, I'm just finding it increasingly hard to care because it's like these new characters, you know, kind of keep coming in and all this interplay between them. There's too much, I guess, intrigue that the the comic is focusing on and it's so much about the it, it, it's so much less about character and much more about just advancing the plot and i don't really care for that so this was about a two and a half out of five you know at best for invincible 91 which is sad because this is looking like it might be a drop but anyway Buffy, Season 9, Number 9. So basically we have our Buffy, Buffy bot. Because it has the mind and memories of Buffy, but it's a Buffy bot. Uh, basically she has a chance to look at the life that she could have had while the real Buffy actually is kind of... God damn, that fucking fan. Sorry. Well, Buffy is actually kind of living that life, but without her memories of ever being a slayer. And, of course, she's just been kidnapped by this as-of-yet nameless, uh, I'm assuming it's a potential. And, you know, we and, you know, and we also have, you know, kind of the, you know, the subplot of Xander and Dawn helping the detective, whose name I keep forgetting, basically her, to hunt down and destroy his zompire-fied partner. So we have this, you know, kind of increasing threat of the zompires because they seem to have something more than they did before, which is they're starting to think more. As before, they were just kind of more like mindless agents of destruction, but now they're they're more. They they just seem to be smarter. And that's a pretty scary thought. Um, but what really works in this issue, because there is that great moment that harkens back to the very first episode of the show, the very first two-parter, the Welcome to the Hellmouth, where Xander basically tells the detective that, you know, look, I mean, I know this is kind of hard for you, but I had to actually kill, I had to stake my own best friend. Uh, you know, his, his, you know, his friend Jesse that was played by Eric Belfort. Anyway, I'm 
I'm geeking out on the show. But anyway, but what's really at the, at the core of this issue and what's very special about it is how the Buffy Buffy bot is uh, reflecting on her own life, what she misses, what she could have had. And just these, these, this really wonderful, uh, these really wonderful moments that this issue has, you know, and her realizations, the, you know, dealing with the fact that she is in fact a vampire, or a vampire, excuse me, a robot. <laughs> and, you know, and, you know, it has also great moments for Spike uh, and it has even better moments for Andrew. So this is really, you know, this this whole issue is like it's like a, a Buffy and Andrew buffet, if you will, because uh, it was just it, it was terrific. Um, I, I I really enjoyed this issue. Um, I'm I'm kind of missing George Jante as the uh, as the artist, but it's I think it's Scott Alley that's doing the art now, and it's solid. I the the subplot with with Xander and the detective it felt like it ran on a little too long and the but and the story itself as far as what I think is important is being cut short. I understand that there's this growing threat here and Dawn's kind of like thrown to the side, uh, which I felt was kind of sucky. But I understand why they went the way they did. It's like I understand everything that happened in this issue. I just wish I guess that it was longer. So. Uh, still a, a, a really good issue, a very solid four, kind of maybe inching more towards four and a half out of five. You know, it's a really uh, very good issue of this comic. Um, so, Thief of Thieves, number four. Um, so we are dealing with, uh, we're dealing with Redmond's son, Augustus, uh, who is a colossal fuck-up. Basically, what I'm seeing here in this in this issue here is it, it's starting to become kind of a culmination of a lot of different things here. Is that we have kind of this incredibly cinematic tale that's being told here. I, it's it's not very realistic, but it's very cinematic, and I love how it's playing with the tropes of the kind of you know the master thief genre. And uh, the the emotional stakes continue to get higher, and they continue to grow with each issue. Because basically, what we have here is you know we just the whole issue is essentially you know it's uh, Augustus in prison, kind of dealing with the cop that was kind of you know faux interrogating, kind of maybe faux flirting with Redmond in the previous issue, and you know and kind of very out of sight. Elmore Leonard fashion, and then we have this issue where you know it's, it's the same cop is interrogating young you know young Augustus, and you know because apparently he's just fucked up things and he's on his third strike, so he's just you know he's just he's been kind of cashing in on his father's reputation and it's gotten him nowhere. He is nowhere near the thief that he should be, or that he that people expect him to be. And he's in some real deep shit here. So, I mean, it, there is kind of one way out for him, and this is kind of where Redmond is really kind of put behind the eight ball. And where this will turn from here, I don't know, but I'm very, very excited to find out. You know, and uh, Shane Martinborough's art, on, particularly on this issue, was it just floored me. I don't know what it was particularly about this issue, but I, I wasn't the biggest fan of his work at first, in the first issue, and since then, although it's just been growing and growing and growing on me. So, just very entertaining, very, uh, like I said, very cinematic. Uh, and, you know, it's like I could see this movie already in my head. Like, this is already, like, a movie that's been cast in my mind. And who do I see as Redmond? I see George Clooney as Redmond. <laughs> I kind of see this as being a Steven Soderbergh film, actually. So, which is probably why I see, I see George Clooney, because, it, you know, like I said, that last issue kind of reminded me of Out of Sight, but I definitely don't see Jennifer Lopez as this cop, because I don't want to see her ever again. So, anyway, uh, a very solid four and a half out of five, inching a little towards five in this one. It just felt too brief. So, 
We'll be right back. We're going to talk more comics, so stick around.